Well, hello and welcome to our thought for the day for Tuesday the 16th of May. Uh, my name is Graham Hoslett. I don't know if you like watching athletics. Some of the most exciting track events are the relay races, especially the sprint relays, the 4x100 and the 4x400 relay races. Of course, the winning team isn't always the fastest. The point of the relay is not so much to cross the line first yourself, but for your team to get the baton across the line first. The number of times the fastest team gets carried away, messes up one of the changeovers, even the last one and the baton is fumbled and dropped. I always find that's what makes the relay quite so exciting. Our psalm today, Psalm 78, is all about passing the baton on. My people, the psalmist writes in verse 1, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable, I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Uh, psalm 78 is a long psalm, 72 verses in all, less a sprint relay, more like a marathon. But it is so long because the writer's purpose is reminding his readers, especially his young readers, of the lessons of their shared past. Telling them and us of the way the Lord acted and worked in delivering his people in the past, but also the people's failure to trust and obey him even so, in the hope that we and those that follow might act and believe and trust differently. Uh, Psalm 78 verse 5 begins with the giving of the law to the Israelites in the desert. Verse 5 says, He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. And why was that important? For, for what particular reason? Well, in verse 7, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Uh, verse 9 goes on. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. Verse 11, they forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. How easy it is to forget. He did miracles in the sight of their ancestors, in verse 12, in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like a wall, the crossing of the Red Sea. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. Uh, a reference to when Moses at the waters of Meribah and Massa, uh, well, a reference to when Moses struck the rock and made the water to flow. In verse 17, but they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They, the people, spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? They said, true, in verse 20, he struck the rock and water gushed out, streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? Talking about the, what was to follow the giving of the manna and the providing of the quail, meat for the people to eat in the desert. Even after he had divided the Red Sea and led the people through, provided water for them from a rock in the desert in response to Moses' prayer, still they would not believe. In verses 23 to 29, the psalmist says, Yet he gave a command to the skies above, he opened the doors of the heavens, he rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Human beings ate the bread of angels. He sent them 
all the food they could eat. They ate till they were gorged. He had given them what they craved. But verse 32, in spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, they did not believe. In verse 34, the, the psalmist goes on, whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They e eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God most high was their redeemer. But how fickle they proved to be. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger, did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again, they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. In verse 42, they did not remember his power. How easy it is to forget. Even miracles, wonders, signs, answers to prayer. Maybe that is part of the problem. A miracle cannot make someone believe. A, a miracle cannot make someone change, choose to go God's way, believe in Jesus rather than their own. You, you would think it would, but it can't. It can make us sit up and take notice but it cannot make us believe. When, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11, John says in verses 45 and 46, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Many of them did, but verse 46 says, some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Even some that saw Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, chose not to believe, but ran off to the Pharisees instead. There are those who even seeing will not believe by choice. And at the end of the Psalm, we can see the specific lesson the Psalmist is pointing out, writing probably after the Northern Kingdom of Israel had been lost and only the Southern Kingdom of Judah was left ruled over by the descendants of David, verse 67 says, then he, God, rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. In verse 70, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. Uh, the psalm ends in praise of King David and David's line. But Psalm 78 is a reminder not to forget the lessons of the past, even our past, but also a, re a reminder too of our duty to pass on to others the lessons passed down to us and also the lessons that we ourselves have learned. Psalm 78 begins, my people hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and things we have known. Things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Um, in athletics, in a relay race, it's not just that the baton must be passed on by each of the runners running. It's also that there's only a short distance allowed in each race, usually marked on the track, for each competitor to receive the baton and then for each competitor to pass the baton on. Each runner must run their allotted 100 meters or 400 meters with the baton in hand, but they mustn't receive the baton too early and they mustn't pass it on too late. If passed on too soon or passed on too late, 
the team is disqualified because one or other of the runners will not have run their allotted distance. Now, what story is it you have to tell of the Lord's goodness, power and might to those that follow? Don't leave it any longer before you pick up the baton and run with it. It's, it's still not too late. But also don't leave it too late before determining how best to pass the baton on.